ahead of Levi Clark. One pitch breaking ball there for a strike to Bergman Mabius. Yeah, another thing I noticed is the Japanese defenders against the Team USA lineup. On their pole side, they're playing extremely deep. Both a third baseman, a shortstop, and a left fielder. They pull, they're playing extremely deep. Evidence, evidence from the last inning, whenever the, the USA hitter did not hit the ball well, the Japanese defenders had to run a long way to get, the, get to those balls. A couple of fly outs to left last inning, ground out to third. Another ground out to third starting this inning. Now even right now, you've seen the third baseman, he's guarding the line and all, uh, almost at the cutout of the infield in the backside. Yeah, maybe one step in front of that cutout. Two balls and two strikes now on maybe as the catcher. Yeah, that's just a pure respect of Team USA's strength. There is one thing that is for sure about this game. This is maybe the most heavily scouted amateur baseball game of the year. Anywhere on the globe as the 2-2 is swung on and missed and down goes Mabius. That'll bring up Carter Johnson with two away. First strike out of the night for Maeda. Yeah, because you think, yeah, this is a good fast one inside corner. And you talk about how this game being heavily scouted. I'm just looking at this match. Yeah, the amount of two-way talent on really all of these rosters here at U18s is so cool to see. And it's something that, you know, 10 years ago, we could have seen players who were playing two ways in an event like this, and you think, well, it's kind of what you have to do, roster limitations and all that. But now we're in this era where two-way players are a thing again in baseball. And obviously Shohei Otani is a huge reason behind that, but you know, there are players who are able to do these things and do it for longer and at higher levels than what they would have been allowed to attempt to do, at least especially for players in the U.S. than maybe 10 or 15 years ago. Yeah, I agree. Like, like you always see two-way players in this type of tournament, but, but back in back in five, 10 years ago, like you mentioned, you know, it's always out of necessity. But right. right now, it seems like these players have the aspiration to become a two-way player later on in pro ranks. Yeah, it's a good way to put it. It's a, it's a necessary thing when you've only got 20 players on a roster. You need to have the depth of players who can pitch. And, you know, it's so common at the high school rank and for all these players coming up. But the fact that that is now an option for a lot of players is a very cool development in baseball in this decade. Count two and two now on Rayner. Yeah, because you're talking about how how, how in Little League, you know, you know, your pitcher is your best athlete, right? So he always can, so your pitcher is always the one that can hit, also play the field the best. But as you grew up, you know, it's very hard to keep being good at both because you're putting so much more work as opposed to a one-way player. And a lot of players give up because of that. But I think because of Otani, people now start doing that. 2-2 two, two, freezing Rainer on the outside corner. A good start to this one for you. Manny Marin will lead things off for the United States, the last man into the batter's box to get his first look at Hugo Maeda. And first pitch swinging and missing. No balls and a strike on Manny. Marin so far in the early going of this tournament. He's gotten the nod every day at shortstop. And two for his first four. Swings and can't get a piece there. Count as one ball and two strikes on him. Yeah, chase a high slider. Marin's walked a couple of times. Doing some good work out of the lower spots in the order for the U.S., but not here as he swings through that one-two pitch, and he's gone on strikes for out number one. That's three strikeouts in the last four batters that Maeda has faced. Yeah, with a one-two count, the catcher was sitting up outside off the strike zone and exactly where Maeda made his pitch and Marin was chasing this high, chasing the outside fastball and swung the miss for a strikeout. So Marin is that but he just looked a little bit over anxious to me as he swung at three pitches and those were not not really a strikes. So with one gone we'll go back to the top of the order and Coy James. Coy James the reigning most outstanding player in the U15 baseball World Cup one of the youngest guys on this roster. Taps the 0-1 foul, quickly 0-2. 
One thing that we were seeing in the early going, Keith, a lot of strikes in the zone from Maeda. From a lot of breaking, from breaking balls as well. That seems to be his pitching strategy, at least for the first couple innings. Yeah, we'll see if that evolves. He's only at 36 pitches as of right now, as the one-two is buried into the dirt. Yeah, Maeda, as of 36 pitches, have thrown 25 strikes. Yeah, I don't have the number in front of me, but I can guarantee you maybe he had thrown more than 50% slider at this point. A ball and two strikes on Coy James. Pitch on the way to him. He's gone on strikes. For the last five now, RKs for Hugo Maeda. And with two gone, it'll bring up Derek Curio. Hey, if they can't hit him, I'm just going to keep throwing them. You know, that's a, that's a curveball bouncing the third that got the hitter to chase. And just like that, two hitters are retired via strikeout in this inning, and we got two outs. Today should be upset their own player. That is a very strange. I have no idea what to write on my scorecard for that. I'm just going to write out, out. <laughs> Double play somehow. Double play somehow. That's what I'm writing. Double play somehow. So a very strange one here. And it'll bring up Levi Clark instead of potentially runners at second and third or runners at first and third or a man at second and one out. He's got bases empty and two outs. The only thing that that reminds me of is we had a an Olympic qualifying event in Florida in 2021 and had a very strange play there where a ball was hit to right field and landed on top of the fence, on top of the home run fence. It landed and stuck. It was one of the weirdest things I've ever seen in my life. It was a U.S.-Canada game, and Canada played that ball back into the infield. They had a fielder throw his hands up, but he went and played the ball, played it back into the infield. It turned into an inside-the-park homer in the confusion, and the ruling was... Because he had played that ball, and hopefully if Gus is listening, he'll correct me on this if my memory is wrong, but because Canada had played that ball, the ball was still live. If the ball had stuck on top of the fence and he had thrown his hands up, that's when play stops. Right. But because he made the effort to play the ball, the play had to be gone through, and the U.S. ended up scoring the extra run. Canada appealed. Because we're playing in a tournament format, you don't really have the luxury of appealing and getting to revisit it overnight or replay a game the next day. So we had to... Uh, adjudicate the, the appeal that night, adjudicate is the correct word. Uh, so that took about 20 minutes, I think, to file the appeal paperwork and everything else. And now after this long layoff, Levi Clark works a walk. This is a very strange fourth inning. No, sorry, no he doesn't because that was a three. So we got a so we got a Team USA that doesn't know how to run the bases, and now he doesn't even know the count. I'm taking this headset off. I'm going home. No. I mean, this is the <laughs> worst <laughs> fundamentally sound USA team I've ever seen, Mike. This is a very strange inning. Very strange inning. And we saw that same thing happen a couple of days ago in, I believe, Panama's game, which a hitter tried to take first on ball three, and that is strike three. And you can see that coming from a mile away, and a very discombobulated United States team heads back to the field in a wild game. It's so one man gone, it'll bring up Carter Johnson. Keith, as we get to work together more and more, you will find that I am a huge uniform nerd, and there is a dude in front of us rocking a uh, Chibolatte Marines Roki Sasaki jersey that I am very sweet on. It is a very cool jersey. It's like a black jersey. It's got black numbers that are outlined in kind of a gradient that goes from orange to pink to blue. I'm very into this look. You want to get your hands on one of those? Yeah, I got to find a Sasaki jersey like that. I know. Well, I know that. Well, fortunately for you, I know that guy. He's, ah! my, he's, my, he's one of my better friends. I'll, Fantastic. I'll ask him for you. <laughs> I'll ask where he get it for you. Roki Sasaki, of course, was a U18 Baseball World Cup participant back in 2019, and now one of the stars of Nippon Professional Baseball in Japan. I believe he's injured for now. Yeah, you certainly hope that that is not going to be a common theme in that guy's career. He is so talented and so exciting, but also such an electric arm that it inherently carries the risk of injury. And the Marines have been really careful with him, but, you know, there's only so much you can do sometimes to avoid injury in young pitchers. Especially when you throw that hard. Yeah. You're just taking a lot of tolls on your body as the pitches builds up. Here's a one-two pitch on the way to Carter Johnson, and that's inside. 
you know, the more I watch, the more I watch baseball and follow baseball, the more I feel that injury are just very hard to prevent, especially yeah. for those flamethrowers. Because you're looking at obviously right now with the uh, what's going on with Otani, and then a lot of hard throwing pitchers in the big leagues. Man, yeah. I mean, with the sports science that's going on right now, I think if someone had figured out how to prevent injury, they would have done so. And you would be the richest man in the world if you had figured out how to prevent, especially those elbow injuries, as the 3-2 was swung on and missed. And that is strikeout number six for Yugo Maeda, who has just fooled this U.S. team up and down the order throughout the night tonight. It's a terrific book written by Jeff Passan, a fantastic baseball journalist in the United States called The Arm. And if you are at all interested in their team over the United States, as we will see 9-1-2 and two from the U.S. here in the sixth. Manny Marin will lead things off. Out of the nine spot, 0 for 1 with a strikeout back in the third inning. And he will get his second look at Yugo Maeda, who continues to work now just over 70 pitches. He's got a long leash to potentially go the distance in this one as he deals in a breaking ball to make it 0 and 2. Yeah, and as we can see, he's still raining kind of sideways. And what will make it interesting, This is, I think this is actually the first time it is raining when Japanese is on defense. I think you're right. It seemed like... We know, especially in that first inning, it was a downpour with the U.S. in the field in the top of that frame. And then the skies cleared from about the bottom of the first inning until the top of this sixth. And yeah, we'll see if and what effect the rain has on Yugo Maeda, who has been brilliant to this point. Five shutout innings, three hits, six strikeouts, no walks. Got a weird double play on the base pads back in the fourth. He's only allowed one man to second base who was erased very quickly. And he's got his seventh strikeout to start things here in the sixth. Yeah, it rises fastball. And when you keep when you throw your slider for strike in the in about knee high and you throw that high fastball, you just change your eye level completely. And that's how that's how he did it to get that strikeout. So Manny Marin is retired. And that brings up Coy James. Keith, it really felt like this game shifted on that weird double play in the fourth. The U.S. with a runner at second base and P.J. Morlando. He grounded a ball back to the mound in case you missed this. Morlando got caught in a run down. I should say Connor Griffin grounded the ball back to the mound with Morlando at second. Morlando caught in a run down. Griffin went into second base. Morlando was chased back to second base. They were both tagged. And in that case, Connor Griffin should have been the runner ruled out. Morlando still had the right to second base. But then Morlando inexplicably left second base and was tagged out after a couple of lengthy reviews as gone on strikes as Coy James for the eighth striker for Maeda. It was correctly ruled a double play, and really almost what felt as it is done after six and two thirds innings of brilliant work, and we will step aside for a timeout to tell you about the new arm when we return. Four nothing, Japan leads it in the sixth. <laughs> 